Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle. My other two co-hosts might be joining me momentarily. I'm not really sure, but we'll see in a second. But no regard, doesn't matter, because we are joined by Mr. Professor Paulson of the Washington Commanders. And before we get started, Logan, just want to say the Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. But Logan, it's been a weird day. It's been a cold, windy, bitter day, kind of like the ending of the game last night. The Commanders lose 20-12. to fall back to the seventh wild card spot now what's your biggest takeaway from that game last night yeah i mean um if i had to say one thing offensively i feel like we got a little bit ahead of our skis i think we kind of outsmarted ourselves a little bit especially in the first two drives of the game kind of the first half of the game you kind of come out you're you're running some stuff that you don't necessarily major in. You're doing a lot of zone read uh, stuff from the offset gun, a little bit more drop back than they've been doing the past couple of weeks. And I felt like, uh, you know, Scott is a really smart guy, but I felt like in this instance, he might've looked at what Philly was doing and said, we can get to some of this stuff in our own way. Mm. And I think when you do that, when you kind of make these game plan runs, these game plan specific opportunities, it makes it really tough sometimes on your offensive line, your skill position guys, because they don't run that play all the time. Uh, you know, like for Wednesday show, I did a breakdown talking about like what I think the identity of the offense is. And one of the things that stuck out to me was like, you know, this is a team that runs a lot of duo. They run a lot of inside zone. They run a lot of gap scheme runs. And when they do that stuff, they, they were very successful yesterday. And I think you see that in the Brian Robinson kind of rushing average, you know, how efficient he was in that. So to me, I think I was surprised that it took him so long to get back to it. And then in the when they came out in the, the start of the second half, like we had talked about off the air, you know, they look like a totally different team. They're kind of right. utilizing their play action stuff. They're use, use, using this heavy uh, duo action fake. This where they get the tight ends coming back across the formation, get the linebackers to bite up. You get double teams on the interior against Dexter Lawrence and uh, um, Leonard Williams. And I think that stuff, again, it allowed you, allowed Taylor, allowed the offense to get the ball to their offensive playmakers. And so I think, Looking at that, I just I feel like maybe the bye week was a little bit too much time. You know, mm-hmm. they kind of uh, overthought it a little bit, okay. um, and they didn't put their guys in the best position to be successful. I, I felt, you know, I felt like, um, you know, you're wasting reps in practice, you're wasting opportunities to kind of to get things uh, squared away, and um, that's just my thought. And obviously, I'm sure Scott has a has a very practical particular reason or the offensive staff has a particular reason for putting those plays in. But that's something that stuck out to me. And then defensively, <clears throat> I was a little surprised to see that. Um, like how conservative Jack played it from a coverage standpoint. He played like a lot of softer cover two quarter shells. And when I say a lot, it's just more than he normally does. And I think, um, you know, if I had to kind of, you know, wager a guess as to why that is, I would say that um, they were probably concerned about the big play. And when you're concerned about the big play, like if you look at the first outing, the only way the Giants are in that game is because they they hit a big play and then they almost – Washington almost loses a game to that touchdown or to that big chunk play to Slayton that he drops yeah. at the end of the, in the fourth quarter there. So I think they were probably like, as long as they don't get a big play, I think we'll be okay. And, um, and I think that that theory, that hypothesis is relatively sound. And I think the only where, way it fell down is when uh, Daniel Jones and that offense just was able to consistently execute on third down. They got that fourth down executed and they were end up t- able to go on a long scoring drive in large part because of the softer coverage shells. I don't want to say that's the only reason, but just a little different philosophy. And again, kudos to the Giants. I think they did an excellent job of kind of cultivating a game plan in around the, the shotgun passing game off of two and three step drops from the gun to let Daniel Jones get the ball out of his hand quickly. And I think that, you know, you have to acknowledge that uh, Kafka, the offensive coordinator for the Giants, did an excellent job with that. Yeah, and like the reason why I looked at that, because it almost seemed like the Giants were expecting for us to be – more concerned than last time of Daniel Jones's running, and that's why our rushers and our guys are playing more back, saying, okay, you know, dink and dunk against us down the field. We don't want to allow you to run the football, and that's why I thought Jack was maybe sitting in that, but mm-hmm. I thought credit to the Giants and their offensive coordinator for literally scheming up exactly what they were expecting. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, you know, kudos to them. I think they did an excellent job uh, of that. And I think, you know, to Jack's defense, I think he did a nice job too, you know, of kind of throwing in some different coverages, bringing blitzes. And it really all game on that side of the ball specifically was just like a cat and mouse game of who's going to be a little bit ahead of the other person. And um, and so 
I think, you know, it, ultimately, like, the defense gives up 13 points. And I think in most games, you're like, that's a pretty solid outing. Um, and I think that that, to me, shows that the offense philosophy was sound. You might have liked them to be a little bit more stout in certain, certain situations. But ultimately, I think, um, you know, at times it didn't feel the cleanest. But when you look at the production at the end, you say, well, you know, they gave up under 300 yards of total offense. And it's just really a handful of plays for them outside of a pretty clean game. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, offensively, I kind of want to talk to you about this kind of team and what they're doing right now, especially in the red zone. Yesterday, they were one for three, obviously had two turnovers. One of them was not in the red zone, but the red zone has been an issue up until this point, Logan. They don't get into the red zone often, but when they do, they have to capitalize on that, and they did not do that last night. What are you seeing out of the red zone offenses? Are they doing anything that trying to be too cute? What do you think the issue is with the red zone offense? Yeah, I mean, I, I did a breakdown of this a couple weeks ago, maybe last week. It's on my Instagram, Logan underscore Paulson82. And one of the things that um, sticks out to me is I feel like they've done a good job of scheming open concepts. And for whatever reason, Taylor has just been kind of very conservative in these that section of the field. And what I mean by conservative, he just, you know, in, in the field, I think one of the things I admire about his play style is despite his kind of lack of physical tools, he plays with great anticipation and puts the ball where it needs to be. And uh, in the red zone, he just seems to be a little bit in his own head about it. Like, I can't turn the football over. I don't want to turn the football over. And that's an area where you kind of got to make plays. In the game yesterday, I felt like there were times where Scott, again, just, uh, you know, I heard uh, Kevin Sheehan say this, and I think it's a very apt description of what it was. He just wasn't feeling the game at a high level. And I think when you're not mm -hmm. feeling the game like that, you can just tell he's a little out of sync. Uh, you know, a call that he should have made it down earlier comes it down late, or he, he tries something that maybe he shouldn't try, and he's kind of out thinking himself, and um, you know that can be challenging, I think, and uh, and that's kind of what I felt, you know, when you give uh, Curtis Samuel a, a short yardage carry on a third and three, um, you know, and Brian Robinson's running for seven and a half yards of carry, like he kind of again he's thinking, man, you know, maybe put the big dog out there and let him see what he can do in those situations. That happened twice, you know, and then there was all the. Uh, kind of zone read RPO stuff they ran early again, just, you know, that's, I don't want to sound like I'm being critical of Scott. I just think it may be in this situation. He, you know, again, overthought it a little bit because I do think over the last couple of weeks, he's done an excellent job kind of refining this team's identity from a run standpoint, developing wrinkles off of those runs and then kind of evolving the drop, uh, the, the play action pass game. And I think you saw that team in the second half and I just wish they would have kind of figured it out and remembered who they were a little bit earlier. Yeah, and like that kind of goes to my question. Do you feel like they maybe are taking too long with these adjustments? Because like we talked about, the the offense is completely different in the second half than they were the first half. Like, why does it take until halftime, Logan? Is that is that something that's like not easy to do? Is it just because everyone's in the same room? Um, yeah. Let me. Uh, yeah. So I think that that's obviously part of it for sure. I think you know you're. It, it, I think it's hard to understand like in the moments in in the flow of the game it's hard to keep track of those adjustments sometimes. And if I remember correctly, I think they only had two, maybe three possessions in the first half. And it's not like they went poorly. I think they were like seven, eight play drives. Uh, obviously they both ended in punts because of penalties and getting mm -hmm. bogged down from negative plays, things like that, kind of in that fringe run zone area. But I think you come out and you say like, you know, obviously there was some type of, I, I, I feel after watching it, there was some type of dialogue between Scott and Ron about who this team is and what they want to be. And mm -hmm. I think you saw that, that kind of difference of opinion that 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 change come out at halftime because that's that's what I thought they would do like my whole thing leading up to the game was like man they're on they're on this really nice trajectory how do they keep innovating in this you know kind of tight zone gap scheme run game and then make make their play action pass game grow even stronger off of it and the second half was that and you saw how effortlessly they moved the ball the way the way they were able to find and cultivate big plays off of that and I just look at myself and I say, man, it's too bad that they kind of missed those opportunities in the first half. Yeah, dude, seriously. You know, it's unfortunate because the Giants, you know, those are winnable games. And for some reason, they just cannot get to it. But let's get to the depressing part, Logan. I want to ask you about the penalties. I think they're mm -hmm. infamous at this point. We don't need to go into specifics. But what did you see from that? Are you the type of person to say we shouldn't allow the refs to get involved with the game? But that being said, there was something off about it. Yeah, so, I mean, to me, it's – 
you know, I, you know, I had a long conversation with my producer today about the the officiating and you know how bad he thought it was and how he thought it affected the outcome of the game. And like when you watch the game, like I do, when you watch the game live and you watch the L twenty two, you see that they missed a whole bunch of other calls that would have helped the Giants out. That you know they missed a couple holding calls on Dexter Lawrence. They missed a, a DPI on uh, on a third and six for them that would have been a first down and put them in scoring position. Like those are plays that are missed also, right? And so. I think if you look at two of the two of the penalties near the end of the game, the 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 one of the two uh, the two point confusion con, uh, conversion, excuse me, I thought that's a legitimate call. Is it a little bit ticky tack? Absolutely, a little bit ticky tack. But is by the letter of the law? Is that a penalty? Yes. Um, the thing with Terry, I know that's extremely frustrating, but he's not. They're not in a legal formation when the ball is snapped, right? And you know, I think I think if I'm looking at it from an offensive player's perspective, I say Taylor could probably have been a little bit more patient there kind of let Terry get lined up if you see everyone's moving around just stop it get the formation right especially in that situation and uh and put and let your guys be in a good position to be successful so obviously two of those I'm kind of I don't really care about I think the offensive the defensive pass interference at the end of the game probably should have been called and I understand why the official doesn't call it I know you don't want to kind of end the game on a penalty but in that critical situation I think when it's that egregious um, he's in the pocket still like that's a penalty. So, um, but referees miss calls all the time. Yeah. And so I'm of the mindset that, um, you know, if you hold on to the football in the red zone, if you're a little bit more efficient in the red zone, if you come out being who you are earlier in that game, if you can make a couple stops defensively, um, it's a totally different ball game, it's a totally different ball game. And I think you kind of walk away with it. So as much as people want to kind of look to blame and point fingers, I don't think that they're, I mean, I understand their, their grievance, but I ultimately like that's football. That's life. It's, it's like the weather. You can complain about the weather all you want, but everyone's <laughs> got to deal with it. So yeah, absolutely. And uh, the refs, sometimes I think that we all do forget that they are watching the play as well. And they're not yeah. perfect. Is sometimes they're probably just watching Taylor and what's going on there and not seeing what's going on the other side of the field to their credit. But let's kind of talk about this next portion. I want to get your opinion on here. Is this based on what you saw last night? And obviously, because everyone's going to talk about the Giants going against the Eagles, and the Eagles just blew the doors off of them, obviously. And they look like a completely different team last night. Looking mm-hmm. forward, is this a playoff team with the Commanders? The Commanders? I mean, ultimately, these are the types of games that playoff teams win. So as much as I think that they're in a situation from a from a philosophy standpoint, from a personnel standpoint, to, to get to the playoffs, ultimately, like – no matter what I think from an evaluation standpoint, you need to win this game. Like that's really what it boils down to, right? Yep. Like this is a game that a playoff team wins, right? That it shows kind of a maturity, uh, a responsibility, and I and I think unfortunately it didn't happen. And you look at the remaining, uh, the remainder of their schedule. They're going to San Francisco. I've started a little San Francisco prep. That is a rolling ball of butcher knives, man. That is a scary football team right now, specific on the defensive side of the ball. They have a lot of pass rushers. They've got great linebackers. They're solid in the secondary. They're playing confident. It's going to be tough. And then that offense is brilliantly executed with Kyle Shanahan. So if you want to, you know, I think that's one of the beautiful things about this home stretch for the team is if you want to prove your playoff team, go beat San Francisco on a tough trip, on a short week, on a long distance trip. Like that's really what it boils down to. Show me your playoff team. And I know they don't need to show me, but in, in, in my experience in the league, like, that's what playoff teams do is they win these types of games. And so if it's not this game, do you beat Dallas at the end of the year, right? You got to win some of these tough games to to prove that you deserve to be in the playoffs because you definitely don't want to be limping into the playoffs, in my opinion. Absolutely. And then uh, to wrap this up, Logan, I only have a couple more questions for you. And I do appreciate always your time being able to take out for us. But that being said, talk about San Francisco next week. I know this is a stupid cliche term, but it's a must win, right? Yeah, I mean, all these all these games in the home stretch right. are relatively must win, right? You got to win two of the next three. I don't know how you get to it. I don't know what you're going to do. Got to find two wins. So you know, is Dallas going to be resting their starters at the end of the year? Is um, Deshaun Watson going to be playing like Deshaun Watson from three years ago? I have no idea. Is Brock Purdy coming back to earth a little bit? Yes, he is. But do you need to find a way to get a win? Any by any means necessary? And two wins in the next three games? Yes. So if you want to say this is a must win, great. It is a must win. But we got to pick two of them. Might as well be this next one. Absolutely agree. And it's in the conference in the NFC. <laughs> um, but this next question I have for you, oh, my goodness, it was on the top of my head. And, of course, I could, oh, talk to you about Taylor, McClo- uh, Taylor Heineke. 
Um, obviously, his game, like 17 of 29, 249, one touchdown, and got sacked three times. But the two fumbles were crucial, and those yeah. are the change, big, big changes in the games for me. What did you think of Taylor's performance last night, him growing as a passer, and then Ron's decision today in his presser saying that they're sticking with Taylor? I mean, I think Taylor deserves to be stuck with. I don't think he's done anything. You know, like when you look at the offense yesterday, I think it, it performed well in the, in the context of who Ron believes this offense to be, right? So when they're running the football, when they're throwing the play action passes, and when they're doing that stuff, he's done a great job. And I think, again, Scott's done a nice job of showing a maturation and a maturity in, in terms of evolving this offense in that capacity. Can he do that? Can he be consistent with that next week is the big question. Um, I do think the first fumble is probably not entirely on Taylor. I think that was a pretty quick win on Charles Leno, and that's a really nice rush by Kayvon Thibodeau, you know, attacking that outside pad and capturing the outside shoulder. I hope he gets the... tested this week, Logan. <laughs> you Dude, see seriously. the power? Dude. You see the power, right? And I think that's something he showed in college, and, you know, he's coming along, so that's good. I think the second one is entirely – on Taylor, and he'd tell you that. And I think he understands how significant that play is. You're you're taking points off the board. You're putting yourself in a tough spot, not only for a field goal, but you give yourself you're taking away a down basically to um, you know, take a shot at the end zone. So I'm sure that's a big deal. And did he miss throws kind of throughout? Miss opportunities, miss reads. Yes, he did. But every quarterback around the league does that. Um, and I you know I like some of the playmaking prowess that he showed. Um, you know, another thing that was kind of. In my craw a little bit is you see how good Terry is on the deep ball. You see how good Jahan is at the deep ball. I don't understand why, um, you know, Deami Brown is getting some of these targets, you know, when you yeah. have these other playmakers. And I and I like Deami. I think Deami's yeah. a good football player. That's a good question. But, but I'd like to see, you know, Jahan on the fleet flicker as opposed to Deami in that situation. Yeah, because you're right, because Terry hasn't had that many deep targets. As I think yeah. the last one you could really think of at the top of your head is Indianapolis, that one crazy right. catch that he had. And that's something that Terry flourishes in. Yeah. Uh, last question that I have for you. Um, going Looking at this team, just overall, straight up, Brian Robinson, obviously 7.4 average on the carry. Going against San Francisco's number one against the run. Do you expect the ground and pound to still be the strategy going forward? Or do you think the second half against the Giants is what we're going to more likely see? I mean, I think you'll see a combination of two, right? Okay. I think that's the thing with the team is like they've earned they've earned that play action pass ability, right? And I think they'd be foolish to say, I, I think that's the, the beautiful thing about this offense is sometimes I think they run the ball too much when they have this ability to kind of take these shots. So I think, what is this tipping point? What is this? Where is the line for them? And um and that's something that I think they need to really look at, you know, this week and kind of say we can get away with more play action shots. And what I mean by that is like, if you look at the second half there, they didn't run any runs. I don't think maybe one run on that long drive where they went down the field, had a couple of big chunk plays. And I think it just shows you they've earned the respect of defenses from a play action pass standpoint and the play action pass element. Yes. It's great because it opens up windows, but also it, it, shores up your protection in a way that yep. it, you don't get from straight drop back. So I think if I'm Scott, if I'm Ron, I look at that and I say, you know, maybe we can treat this almost like our drop back passing game because that's how this protection is working for us. And I'm sure, you know, D'Amico Ryans is going to have an excellent plan for this because they know we like to do this. But I'd kind of say, like, we're really good at executing it. So let's see if we can kind of, again, kind of melt, fi find a, a middle point here between ground, like pounding the rock, and yeah. throwing the football. And because I think, quite frankly, man, this San Francisco defense is excellent. They're excellent at stopping the run. They haven't had anybody who's kind of just put their mouthpiece in and run right at them. This team's going to try and do that. And Brian Robinson's a big, strong dude. So maybe they can kind of make this three and a half yards of carry work for them. But it is going to be a tough, long slobber knocker of a game. And if, that, one, if that's the approach, I, I loved it. I love, always appreciate it. Last thing because I forgot to ask you. Jahan Dotson, four receptions, 105 yards, one touchdown on six targets. I mean, how good is this kid, Logan? I mean, I, you know, we've talked about Jahan. We talked. To, I remember talking to you about Jahan in the draft, right? Yeah. And how, like, he was uh, – I was trying to – I went back and looked at my notes the other day. You know, it was Williams, the kid from Alabama, mm -hmm. Drake London, um, Wilson in, uh, in New York now, and then him was my fourth guy. And I think – you're seeing some of what makes him special. You're seeing some of the route running nuance on the post. You're seeing some of the kind of uh, body control, um, contortion ability, the excellent hands, the, the the physicality at the catch point. 
Yeah, I mean, he's he's a special player. And, you know, he he doesn't always look like he's running a thousand miles an hour, but he does make plays. And that's something that I respect about his game. And I'm glad that Taylor seems to be developing a chemistry with him. You know, one of you know, everyone talks about the touchdown, the big long throw. One of my favorite throws that Taylor had with Jahan was the corner route in yes. the red zone. Because it's on timing, yep. you know, it's on timing. And that's something that he didn't have with John. That That's a level of trust he didn't have. And so I think as that piece develops, as, um, you know, Terry continues to keep, keep that relationship with him, as Curtis finds his touches in this offense, that's a really scary, scary group of playmakers. And I think, um, you know, given the right opportunity, given the right play calling, given the right game plan, you know, this can be a very dangerous offense. Yeah, and I thought that was a great throw by Taylor to the sideline to Jahan. And obviously Jahan, the one-handed grab over the defender. I mean, yeah. goodness, the kid is an animal. Logan, yeah. I can't thank you enough. I'm sorry that you scared away the other two hosts and they weren't able to come here and ask you questions. I know they've been looking forward to it, but, sir, I can't thank you enough. Uh, you could go follow Logan at Logan underscore Paulson82 on Instagram. Also, has got the podcast Take Command with Craig Hoffman. Make sure you guys go and check that out. Logan, as always, sir, I appreciate your time. Hey, thanks for having me on, man, and uh, tell the other guys I said what's up. I will do, brother. Have a good night, man. All right, thanks. You too. Later. All right, everybody. We just spoke with the man, Mr. Logan Paulson. I mean, we we got to love talking to Logan. But that being said, I I decided to double dip for this episode. So I, I decided to bring in my other guy here. I like I like to call him. I have a nickname for him. Mr. Jamal, the intellectual forest, is joining me now to ca- talk about, try to make sense of this game. Jamal, what's going on, brother? How you doing? I'm all right, boss, man. Can you hear me? Everything good with audio? You sound perfect, brother. I hope you got the cup sitting next to you like last time. <laughs> there we go, my man. <laughs> so I we kind of talked. I talked to Logan a little bit ago, and we kind of talked about the offense. But I want to kind of get your opinion of the defense and their performance of yesterday. Obviously, the Giants put up 20 points, Jamal, but the defense they only gave up 13. How did you think that they did in this game? Because it's kind of a weird question to ask. Yeah, um, I would say I would say this much like it was confusing um, to start the things out. Like I, I really thought that uh, just from an overall roster perspective that Washington had the horses. And uh, what I mean by that is like um, if you can eliminate Daniel Jones being a threat with his legs and um, everything, I think after that will we'll fall in line. Like I don't really trust their offensive line to stop uh, to to. To, to really produce for Saquon. Saquon will have to produce a lot of his yards for himself. Um, and at one point, like, the run, the run game was true, right? But then you look at how the Giants adjusted to how the, the commanders came out. Yeah. And, and the commanders came out in a situation where they, they really planned for Daniel Jones and everything was effective to that degree. But now you have to account for the pass game. And, and like, it was... I'm saying all this to say, like, it was all of this chess match stuff between the offensive coordinator and the Giants and then how Jack Del Rio came out initially planning for defending Daniel Jones and defending Saquon. And, like, that's the push and pull you ultimately see. And to your point, Kyle, you said they gave up 13 points. 13 points is, is at the end of the day, that's winning football. Point blank, period. End of the day, 13 points is winning football. Um, And... It's just probably some moments that surprises you, especially the 97-yard drive, like a, a very good defense, a championship-level defense, an elite-level defense. Like you don't see a 97-yard drive uh, a, a, a accumulate like that, let alone end in a touchdown as well. Like Essentially, I saw a number earlier today, Kyle, where they went like a total of 104 yards because there was a penalty on the drive. Oh. So – they went 104 yards, including the penalty yardage that they had to get back. So, like the the amount of 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 um like chess match, chess play, all that stuff, the strategical um implementation of what they want to do for, with their players, like that stood out in a major way. I mean, it stood out in a major way on that 97 yard drive, understanding that we're not going to settle for a field goal. Uh, given the situation, I, I like how we're in rhythm. I like the flow of our offense. I'm going to give these guys a shot on fourth down because I'm not going to put it in the hands of our punter because they were in the same they were on the same spot of the field yeah. at Washington punted on in the first quarter. So I'm not going to give the punter an opportunity to punt the ball. I'm going to keep it in the hands of our offense. We didn't move this far. Why would I? Why would I punt it? So like that was one thing. And then obviously the last drive that led to the, the field goal to put them up 20 to 12, 
was another one where you just look at them and say they really found their groove. Um, they really found what they wanted to get done, and it showed itself on the first three carries of that drive with Saquon popping 10-plus yard runs, ultimately got like three, yeah. three five yards or something like that. It was crazy to see, but I really think, honestly, the defense still played well. Um, they weren't able to get pressure um, and really put uh, get any sacks on Daniel Jones, but I think for like a large scale against – like it's good enough to win. Point blank period, good enough to win. Um, it was just a battle between um a, a smart defensive coordinator and a smart offensive coordinator who just played each other two weeks ago. Yeah, and that, that was the crazy thing I was saying to Logan earlier because like the Giants knew that Washington would be concerned and focused on limiting Daniel Jones. So that's why they went to that zonage and they were kind of basically saying, you know, you're not gonna run on us, but you know, dink and dunk. And it the crazy thing is there was no like <laughs> adaptation to it like they came in with it and were effective with it it was almost like the Giants were on the bye week that's what it felt to me on how that they were executing because it's not like this is the offense they've been running the whole time this is something different and like that's why I was like I was kind of blown away by that I was like all right that's impressive to do Uh, you got to give them credit for that yeah and and I I think that's the thing um when you kind of under well two things I understand that like there are some fans, Washington fans out there, and, and NFL fans who only really follow their team. Like yeah. they don't care about other teams, and especially they don't care about teams in their division. But if you are a fan of football and like you kind of understand like other teams have to execute too, they have jobs to do too. Uh to your point, Cal, it's like the only slack that I'm really willing to give up is the fact that it is on the defensive side of the football. It's not gonna be I'm not going to have the same opinion on that offensive side of football, but the defense side of football, I can really cut some slack for these guys in the sense of holding that team to 13 points, two of 10, I think on third down, if not one of 10, as you hold them a third down, yep. um, you give your offense multiple chances to get the, to get the ball back and put up some points. And they let you down on several occasions. Um, and that's not, that's not new. It happens. It happened all season, uh, season long. Um, so you're in that situation where, uh, you know, you're still doing your job despite the fact that you aren't changing the game and helping your offense out from a turnover standpoint or from a big play standpoint. Uh, that's one thing. But at the end of the day, um, you gave your ball, you gave the ball back to your offense um, multiple times after a third down attempt for the Giants and uh, your offense just did not help you. Absolutely. I agree with you and wholeheartedly. Jamal, that's why I like to have you on here. You, you are the intellectual. But now we are joined by our, our co host Mr. Mike Hall, how you doing, brother? Are you, you all right? Yeah, yeah. Just wasn't looking at the time. We were saying, was cooking, looked up and was like, oh. Uh, you, I mean, do you have a question he, for he, Jamal? He was feeling something, bro. I, I, look, I don't blame Mike. You know what I'm saying? That, <laughs> after, after a late night embarrassment like that. <laughs> right. Kayvon Thibodeau did it to him. He knocked him out for 24 hours. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, let's see. Have you asked him about like the quarterback? Like, do you think that um, if Taylor has another uh, iffy game against San Francisco for the last two game stretch to maybe get into the playoffs, do you think that Ron Rivera goes back to Wentz, or do you think he just rides it out with Taylor for these last couple games? Um, so that's an interesting question. Um, because we talked about it yesterday on the Trapper Dive podcast. Um, and I will say this. But I don't know where this conversation is going to take me. So I'll just start off with this. <sighs> Fellas, um, I, I thought about this a lot. And, and I haven't been able to, at, at the time in which we're recording, I have not been able to go through the entire offensive film yet. Um, like the first thing I did when I when the tape came out was I went through the problem place. <laughs> I said I had to get this out of my system. and, and figure <laughs> out. But my thing is my gut feel throughout that game um was two things one scott turner got away from you know what worked well i mean that's the obvious thing right scott turner got away from what worked well with this team he also didn't have a good feel for the game and, and understanding that uh brian robinson and antonio gibson flat out should have had a minimum of 30 carries combined like there was no need to incorporate anything else even with deami brown having a a, a well-timed reverse or sweep that went for 15 yards. Like, altogether, from an overall standpoint, they should have had a minimum of 30 carries in that game, Brian Robinson and Antonio Gibson. But what I mean by that is, and where I'm getting with Taylor Heineke, is that Scott Turner and both Taylor Heineke, I feel like 
um, there may have been some ulterior motives in this game. Not nothing devious, but just in the fact that they knew and they recognized the moment that this was a primetime game. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I believe that we can do something special in this moment. We had three weeks to prepare for these guys. I'm going to get away from what works best, and I'm going to put a lot of the shoulder or a lot of the load on Taylor Heineke's back. But then I also want people to see that I can I can out execute uh, Wink Martindale, who embarrassed me two weeks ago. Um, so with those combination of issues that's happening, um, and again, it's my opinion that I think that they was really they had ulterior motives. They really wanted to show out on Sunday night prime time. I think that's that's what it more was than anything else. But with Taylor not being able to execute once again in certain situations, uh, several situations, um, in particular in the first half, um, a couple on that last drive that was obviously problematic. Um, and it, obviously the two turnovers as well. Like it, the list can continue uh, on the bad side. Um, he did have some good moments as well, specifically coming out of that first, uh, that second half, that very first drive where they he emphasized Terry, he emphasized Jahan. Um, and then on the drive where he fumbled, the first play out of that was the play action. Or I don't know if it's play action. I can't remember. But that 60-yard bomb to Jahan Dotson, I'm like, he had good moments in the game. But when you're not putting up points, and Ron Rivera even said it, I think, today, um, he told Taylor, he had to sit down with Taylor, like, hey, look, we need to score when we get into the, in, inside the 20. We need to <laughs> score when we get inside the red zone. Like, he had that conversation with Taylor. And when you share that type of insight and understand that um, Taylor is not, uh, like, an elite quarterback who is getting you, like, game-changing plays, difference-making plays, that performance – in that slot to start a four-game stretch where you couldn't lose to the Giants, you couldn't afford to lose to the Giants, it should be on the top of um, Rivera's head. And to answer your question, I know it was a very long response, Mike, but I really wanted to, like, bring it all together. I love your um, passion. Oh, when you think about everything that went with um, that game Sunday night, and then you think about what's upcoming next against the San Francisco 49ers, the margin for error was already small, but it becomes even smaller uh, in, a sense, in, a, in an instance when you're going against a top three defense and a legitimate number one defense in the NFL, um, his job is probably on the line to the point where he may get replaced during the game. Like, his room for error was already small, but now, like, you can't afford to have any mishaps in the San Francisco game because they may be convinced that there is no way around this this negative play with Carson Wentz finally active and finally being able to back you up. Yeah, and look, he's a good backup to have, and ju- it, it's always good to just to have him there because you feel good about that, knowing that he can't come in. He's a veteran that he could probably help out in that breath. But, Jamal, to wrap this up, I only have a couple more questions for you. You know, you yourself, you are an athlete. You played this game. You have a love for the game. You have a great eye for the game as well. Talk to me about Chase Young um, because, obviously, him not playing in this game was a big – point of emphasis for everybody do you understand it like do you uh, do you understand like you want it to be more of a patience thing and then on the side note do you think that this is more of a chase young decision not to play or a team um that's another good question fellas um that i'm not gonna answer (laughs) (laughs) well where i I really think that and i said this i actually said this yesterday so I, i my perspective changed within like the last 24 hours um, I, I thought that Chase Young, and for a long time, I thought that if Chase Young didn't play the last three, the last four games, or if he missed the Giants game, then he should just be, you know, set aside. Uh, but an alternative perspective is for me understanding that, um, you know, Chase Young is coming off a significant injury, and whether or not he can get one or two games in will work for the team, it will work for himself, and I think that's important as well. Um, so I don't think that I, I know what you asked me, but I don't think that he'll be shut down after after the Giants game. Um, I do think that the way that they're playing this in the media is very weird. It's not uncommon from Rivera in in, in how they're kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, not necessarily too in depth or or too direct or they don't put much insight on injuries. But at the same time, like you don't really know what's going on with this guy. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is um, I, I, I feel like uh, for Chase, 
it is probably like his personal. I don't think it's coaches. Um, I think that Chase Young is in a situation where, um, you know, if the doctors have cleared him to this point, the only thing that you really have left to think about is, is like your mental side. And, and if the coaches are seeing like situations in practice where, you know, he's a little bit hesitant and he's not um, comfortable doing a certain task, whatever, whatever it is in practice, whatever it is, if they don't feel comfortable saying that, then, um, you know, he's not stepping on the field either. So they, I think they kind of like, they're kind of working hand in hand, but it really comes down to how Chase Young is reacting instinctively off of the knee injury. Um, so who knows? Um, but I, I do think that if he does show that he's ready in practice, he should get um, a couple of these games uh, before the season is over. Hey, last one real quick uh, before you get here. I know you're very busy. You got you got drinking to do. <laughs> J- Jahan Dotson. Um, I know that obviously he right now, I think has six touchdowns on the year. Um, and he's, he's probably one of the least underperformed guys that are possibly rookie of the year, but given with how he's projecting upward the past couple weeks, do you think Jahan has a chance to win that? Nah, man. Um, <laughs> not even his fault. It's really not his fault. It's like, not his fault. I think that if he didn't get hurt, he will be up there. Like, I, I really think that. But the only issue is how like, you think about Gary Wilson in New York, um, Chris Olave in New Orleans. Like, statistically, their numbers are already better than uh, Jahan's. And uh, Christian Watson, who came out of, like, who, like, surged yeah. over, like, a four-game period, um, his numbers came out of nowhere. But they were all there in the sense of, like, Jahan was, you know, injured. So, I mean, it is what it is. But with that being said, um, when you think about, like, the rookie of the year, I think that he'll have some recognition. And I think that there will be, like, from a national perspective, I think that there will be some people who shout him out knowing that at one point, uh, like, four or five weeks into the season, even when he got hurt, like, a week or two into his injury, (laughs) he was still leading um, the rookie receivers in touchdowns, uh, albeit it was four. But from an NFL, like an overall NFL perspective, he was still top 10 for a good period of time. Um, so I think that is important. And, and, and if you can understand, like, the threat that he presented in the red zone, I think he'll get some recognition. But um, unfortunately, and it's crazy because I'm a competitor, bro. Like, I wanted that rookie of the year so bad, or offensive rookie of the year at least, so bad for Jahan. Um, and I was pissed off when he got hurt. And I don't even, I'm not even a person dealing with the injury. Like, I was <laughs> – so, so it's like seeing where Jahan is right now and understanding that, um, you know, he's an, he's a hell of a player. He's a hell of an athlete. Um, like what he did in that game against uh, the Giants, like his, adju- his ability to adjust to, to football is like from an instinctive standpoint, like it looks so easy. Like it's, it's, excuse me, not, let me be clear. It's difficult catches that he makes look so easy because those are easy to him. And, and, and like, you can, you can try that 10 times if you're, if you're, if you're an athletic person, like you can try that 10 times and like, you'll probably get that one time. Like Jahan can make that catch seven or eight times. Like that's how normal of a catch that is to him. If you're and white it, at zero. His ability, <laughs> his ability <laughs> and, 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 and have the hands to, to snag them uh, is just incredible to see. So, um, yeah, I don't think he'll win Rookie of the Year. I don't think he'll run Offensive Rookie of the Year. Um, and it's mainly due to injury as opposed to the fact that yeah. um, he's, not, he's not as good as other people because that's not true. I think he's up there and, and injury aside uh, should show that. Um, but statistically, he just won't get it. Running full speed, jumping in front of and over the defender to catch it with one hand and swiping it away from him. I, my goodness, the dude is an animal. Yeah. Jamal, yep. I can't thank you enough for joining us, uh, my brother. I hope you have a good evening. Before we get out of here, would you like to plug your social media handle and also the Trapper Dive podcast, kind of explain to our uh, fans what exactly where you can find it, what days you record, so they can come subscribe and follow. Yes, sir, man. I appreciate it as always, Kyle. appreciate you as well. Um, and and I think for me, uh, my bad, Mike. I, I don't know why I, I didn't say your name. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, uh, you can find me. On Twitter at Let Maul Tell It M U A L. Um, I tell people all the time, don't forget the U because um, you know, they misspell my name all the time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so you can, uh Jamal. But you can find me on Twitter at Let Maul Tell It. Uh and then Trapper Dive, we uh do 
three shows a week, man. Um, Tuesday, Thursday, uh, just a recap on Tuesday, Thursday is pregame, and then Sunday is is post game, um, immediate post game instant reaction. Uh, you can search Trap or Dive podcast on YouTube; it'll pop up. I um, mean, yeah, that's kind of where we that's kind of where we reside, man. On, on that side of things, uh, really good show, obviously with AJ and Dre and myself, and we we kind of go through uh, the Washington side of things as well. So again, like I said, I appreciate y'all having me as always, man. Anytime, Kyle. Anytime, Mike. Y'all need me. Uh, and y'all want to chop it up, talk some ball, man. I'm here for it. And we're, I'm always here for the intellectual, Jamal. You you already know that. But, of <laughs> course, besides his YouTube channel, also he does incredible film breakdowns on Twitter. So make sure yeah, you yeah. do go follow lo, Let Maul Tell It because it's absolutely – it goes in with the All-22. Before anyone else has it, for Washington fans, it's a must-follow. Maul, I can't thank you enough, brother. Enjoy the Monday night football matchup and stay warm. Yes, sir, man. Appreciate it. Y'all boys be safe. Appreciate you, too, brother. you brother. Appreciate you. All right, everybody, we just spoke with the man, Mr. Jamal Forrest. Glad you could join me, sir. How are you doing? Good, man. Like I said, I was cooking some dinner and then looked up and was like, oh, it's like almost 8.15. Cooking something in there. I don't know what. It probably wasn't dinner, though. (laughs) 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 No, I'm stupid. No, hey, dude, I know this was a uh, kind of demoralizing, not demoralizing loss, but just the way that it unfolded in a way that um, it just seems like it's one of those Washington things that kind of like just has that embarrassment, kind of bitter taste to it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But let's kind of answer these fan questions as we recap the game, you and I together, because obviously we haven't talked a lot about it. And there's a lot to discuss. But that being said, this question is from Cole's Mullet, who DM me on Twitter. Linebacker depth. Is Cole Holcomb in the same ballpark as Bostic? My opinion, Bostic is absolute trash when we realize we need more than just someone who knows the system. Also, what's the problem with Baker? Had the swagger of Heine Hole, but overall a better experienced quarterback. Is it worth the money more? Basically saying to go after Baker Mayfield next season. But is Cole Holcomb in the same bar- ballpark as Bostic? And uh, honestly, Cole Mullet, I don't think that they're in the same sphere I look, I, I respect John Bostic a lot. I think that he is a very smart football player. He's come in and been serviceable when we've needed him because Cole has been off the field. That being said, he is limited to an extent, and that limited ability is what really hurts his team on the perimeter. And um, obviously we saw that against Saquon Barkley yesterday. Poor John Bostic, man. He just gets <laughs> picked on, and it's not yeah, his fault. He's just out there getting paid. So, John Bostic, I'm sorry, brother, but, yeah, Cole Holcomb is just a step above because of the athletic ability, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I don't think that they're they're in the same the same tier, the same ranking, because I do think that Cole Holcomb is like a, a step above John Bostic. Obviously, Cole's younger, more athletic. Even though to John Bostic's credit, this season overall, he hasn't really been that that detriment that he was right. a couple years ago that everyone was kind of like, Why is he on the team? Get rid of him. So he's actually been kind of serviceable serviceable this uh this season for sure. But yeah, I definitely think that Cole Holcomb is just a a step above uh, John Bostic. Obviously, Cole Holcomb's not a world beater. He's just an average, solid linebacker. But, uh, yeah, I think that uh, Cole's a little bit better. But as far as Baker Mayfield goes, if this would have been two years ago and it was Baker Mayfield and he wasn't coming off of the, just the horribleness that he had, even though he was injured in Cleveland his last year there, and then obviously the whole Carolina situation – I do think that uh, he has the he has a chip back on his shoulder and chip on his shoulder. Baker is the best Baker. But with that being said, I think that uh, I think Jim and Sean McVay actually are going to be a good pairing. I think that uh, yeah. they, they uh, found their home together, dude, to exactly. be honest, because I, like, uh, I think Matt Stafford's going to ride off into the sunset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that uh, Baker and Baker and Sean McVay kind of have that they're cut from that same kind of competitive cloth and because uh, they're white and they're short. Yeah, that too. Um, <laughs> now, nah, but I think that uh, Baker, he's probably going to be an L.A. guy. I think that Sean McVay kind of likes him. Obviously, we'll see what Baker does tonight against Aaron Rodgers and the Packers. But, um, yeah, I would rather – I mean, if it came down to, like, Sam Howell or Baker Mayfield, I would rather just roll with Sam Howell. And you already know how I feel about the whole Sam Howell situation. Yeah. Now, this next question is from Twitter. Tony Franchise and Donnell Wilson asked us the same type of question, and I'll ask both, but there's the same question, essentially. It wasn't all his fault, says Tony. We lost, but will there be a quarterback change back to Wentz before the season is over? And Donnell Wilson's question was, do you think Wentz will get another crack at starting? Um, yeah, well, we uh, kind of talked about it with Jamal. Uh, me, personally... I think that I've always had that kind of the thought that Taylor is on a not uh, not really like a short leash, but 
a uh, a medium sized leash, I guess if you want to call that. Like, I... oh no, dude, it just went out. It just went out. Yeah, hold on, just keep tapping your microphone when it comes back on. I'll let you know. Um, but so I, I, you know, I've always felt that it was going to be injury to push Taylor out. To be perfectly honest, I know that the game is lackluster. They didn't put up points, but it wasn't. I know that Taylor threw a couple errant balls. But obviously the fumble, it's like one of those plays where you're just like, why? Because it's not like overly stupid. Like he's trying to escape the play. It's what you're supposed to be doing. But put two hands on it. But it's just like one of those situ- situations like, why? Just why yeah. does that have to happen? Why does it have to be the worst case scenario? And I know that everyone wants more points scored. And I 100% agree. And I want it too. And I want the red zone ability. But I think Sam Forty of the Washington Post put out a great point earlier about Taylor's in- uh, inaccuracy being like, I think like, want like 10% accuracy inside the red zone, the low red zone, which is between the 15 and in. And I I, I don't know what the issue is there, but it does bring back the, the Trevor Lawrence pass that he threw the Zay Jones in the end zone, where it's a confident dart right between three defenders because he's feeling it. And that, that's not what Taylor has at the moment. And I think Jamal is right about that. He's like, he is kind of concerned about throwing away that throwing a pick because he knows what everyone will say. And he knows that everyone will be calling for his job and they want him gone. And that's why he's playing like the way he is in that court sort of setting because he doesn't want to make the mistake. And I, that's just how I feel about it. Yeah, um, to your red zone part uh, point, I think that's uh, – it has to go with the whole arm strength thing where it's kind of like you got to be able to fit that ball when it's condensed down in the yeah. red zone. You got to get it in tight windows. And obviously, the arm strength is not a – like the biggest attribute that Taylor Heineke has. So um, – he has to throw with anticipation, and again, when you're when you're condensed down in the red zone, everyone's kind of bunched up and jumbled around in there. You can't really throw with that much anticipation because there's going to be multiple defenders around the ball, or where you're trying to get the ball to. So, um, yeah, red zone. The red zone stuff is definitely concerning. The, I mean, he did kind of get out the pocket and run a little bit last night, but just the fact that he doesn't seem to want to use his legs as much as he did that 2020 year, and then even that 2021 year. So, um, yeah, I think that, uh, like to their question, I think that uh, pretty much, I think how he plays in San Francisco is going to be the determining factor on who's going to be the starter going into that week, what would it be, week 17 game against the Browns, Mm -hmm. which if we lose to San Francisco, obviously that Cleveland game is going to be a have to have it game. So it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in San Francisco on Saturday and going forward to that following Sunday. Yeah, now this next question is from the Discord chat server, Brandon Reinbold Meast. Thank you, sir. His question is, besides the obvious officiating calls, what is the biggest reason for the loss? Offensive play call was inconsistent. We only ran five times in the second half looking at the bright side. The majority of the fan base won in Minnesota in the playoffs. Now we're lined up to play against Minnesota in the playoffs. But with that being said, what are the chances to turn things around and hang on to the last playoff spot? Man, is they got to turn it around because obviously everyone sees Detroit is coming in hot right now, and obviously they beat us in week two. They have the tiebreaker over us, so yeah, they got to get it together or else they're gonna get um, leapfrogged by Detroit coming up here soon. So uh, yeah, I think that uh, what was the original question? Yeah, basically, like, what do you think that they're gonna do? Like, oh, do you think yeah, that yeah. they could turn it around and get yeah, the last yeah, um, spot? Yeah, so, oh, that's what it was, the the game last night. So, yeah, to your uh, the first part of the question, I think that, obviously, like like we talked about with Jamal, Scott Turner got away from what got us to this point, which is running the ball, Brian Robinson up the middle on the outside, Antonio Gibson on the outside, stretching the defense out, and then making that easy, making the easy window throws for Taylor, like on the play-action stuff, like, like Coach Ron was talking about in this presser today, where he wants to be a ground-and-pound team and work that play action into that, which obviously, like I said, it opens up the windows for a guy with not a lot of arm strength. It opens up the windows for to for him to make an easy throw. So um, we definitely got away from the run game. Like Jamal said, AG and uh, Robinson should have had at least 30 plus touches combined together. Um, I know why they did it because they were down 14 to three at halftime. So they had to kind of throw themselves back in it. But again, once you kind of get back into the game, I would like, I would have liked to see Scott Turner get back to that run game, especially because Byron Robinson was, just eating eating yards alive against the Giants. They couldn't stop him for the most part. So, um, yeah, I mean, look, San Francisco's a, obviously a tough team. They have a great defense, but if this defensive line, who I was kind of disappointed in last night because they didn't really get the pressure I thought they would, 
But if they can hold a team like San Francisco to 13, 16 points, there should be no reason outside of Nick Bosa and that great defense that Taylor Heineke shouldn't be able to at least move the ball on them and if not put up a couple points. So um, we'll see what happens. But, yeah, to uh, answer the question in just in totality, uh, I think they are going to go back to Wentz, and we'll see if Wentz is going to be able to turn it around for him. Yeah, the one thing I will say, um, the biggest reasons for the loss, Meese, and it's hard to say that because there is so many things that go into it. But to be honest, it's third down, it's red zone, and it's the turnovers. The turnovers, in my opinion, I know I was kind of frustrated on Twitter today, but I, I, <laughs> I, I always was. am. I always am. But like, especially now, like because I hate these divisional losses, especially in a kind of an embarrassing setting. But it was the turnovers. The first turnover is not on Taylor Heineke, and I know what Ron Rivera is saying, and I get it. I wholeheartedly do. But when you know that your offensive line is dinged up. And the only strength that you really have and confidence that you have is one position. And that one position is a veteran and can't stop somebody for more than two seconds in order to make a play be successful. I have a problem with that. And I think that that shows a major concern. And that's my, so for me, it was the turnovers. The one, not Taylor's fault. The other one is Taylor's fault. But it's just one of those why plays. Like, why do you have to be so careless with it? Like, yeah. why, why don't you dive into the end zone and get that touchdown there? Like, why that, doesn't that, Jahan? That my mind. Yeah, why doesn't Jahan go up and block him? Like, that, that was like the craziest play I've ever seen in my life. And it was like, it was just chaos. And it was like, <laughs> nobody was really like playing like the right way, being smart about it. That play was really weird to me. Because I felt weird. like Jahan should have blocked him. But I also feel like Taylor should have read Jahan over there and came inside of him naturally, um, right? I, exactly. I was just about to say that. Like, I mean, I, I think that was like Kayvon Thibodeau or like a linebacker or something like that. So I can see kind of why Jahan Dotson was kind of like, oh, snap. Like, this dude's huge. Let me just kind of get in his way, basically. But to your point, if you I, – I watched that play. So, I mean, even when I watched it live, I was like – first of all, I was like, why didn't you cut it back? Like, that's my whole point. It was like the cutback lane was there. And he still kept running it to the sideline for another like couple yards. If he would have turned it up the field earlier, a little bit earlier, he literally easily just walks into the end zone. But also, I was like, the Taylor Heineke I know would have drove for that pylon. And again, to maybe to the bigger point of why he's not running a lot, I think that he knows that he's on thin ice and any type of time he spends outside the, out out the game getting knocked out injured whatever it may be they're probably he's probably gonna lose his job so I think that in his back of his mind he's like I gotta play that kind of Taylor Heineke swag type of football but also I gotta keep myself healthy and safe and we saw the result of that where he didn't get in that touchdown so yeah that was definitely the a really 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 frustrating sequence of uh events but I mean it is what it is yeah dude I was gonna give out chores today but I feel like um, everyone offensively deserves chores to an extent. Except, except for Dotson. Yeah, I Dotson and Terry, obviously. I know Diami Brown tried his butt off. Like T- Taylor overthrew Diami. Like, yeah, I, mean, I, I saw somebody on Twitter today and said, yeah, go figure. Of course Taylor threw over Diami. I was like, what? Like when does that happen? <laughs> like, when, that doesn't happen, bro. It's like it's, it's like the whole Logan Thomas thing. The man is the biggest person on the field, the tallest person on the field, six foot eight, and somehow you're overthrowing a six foot eight player. Right. Like it's just it's just. Well, I meant more like a deep shot because everyone talks about his new yeah, yeah, arm, no, but he's, he's like, so fast. Yeah, he yeah. throws a cannon, but it was just funny. Now, I mean, when he threw that pass to Dotson, I was like, I didn't know Taylor had that in him. I was like, oh. He's worked on his arm strength, dude, and and a lot go. It goes a long way when a quarterback is actually able to step up into the pocket. Uh, exactly. of, of course, but now this exactly. next question from Andy Lockhart Hall is what in the UK in the Discord chat server? Oi, when is Scott Oi. Turner going to be getting his fired papers? I'm sick of him in the biggest <laughs> way. Um, I mean that's a good question. Um, Ron's going to have some decisions to make this upcoming off season. Um, I said it when they extended him. I was like, I mean, cool, but like in my opinion, I was like, what did he have? What has he done so far to deserve that extension already? Like. I would have let that like I would have let last year play out first before I thought about extending him. But I mean, I get why he did it because he wanted to make all their contracts kind of run through with each other, I guess, as well. But uh me personally, like going into the season, I said this on Twitter too. Me personally going into the season, I wanted to give Scott I was giving Scott the benefit of the doubt because obviously the weapons haven't really been there outside of Terry and like AG. The quarterback position has been 
just ridiculous, obviously. So I wanted to say, okay, we got a running game. We got like running backs. We got the quarterback that they wanted with a like an actual NFL legit arm. We got the weapons. They drafted Dotson. They got Curtis Samuel back healthy. So I said, okay, this is the year I judge Scott Turner. And if I was a judge, he'd be getting a 30 to 60 days in jails right now because this man is just habitually violated probation. So I just think that, I don't know, like, obviously I'm not calling for someone to get fired, like, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, it's like, like I said, Ron Rivera is going to have some, uh, some tough decisions to uh, make this upcoming off season. But if they, so if you would have told, if you say, Hey, we have a chance to hire Frank Wright and let go of Scott Turner, then I would be hundred percent for that. But if you're going to get rid of Scott Turner, obviously I want to know who the person that's coming in after him because it could be another Scott Turner kind of uh, an un, an unaccomplished, un, uh, un uh, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, Underappreciated? Uh, yeah, like a under an underrated kind of like a unknown uh, offensive coordinator that you're not, you're not going to know what you're going to get with him. So um, if you can have like a legit, like established uh, veteran offensive coordinator, like a Frank Wright, you can kind of bring in, swap him out for uh, Scott Turner. Cool, but yeah, Toronto Rivera got some choices. He's got some uh, hard choices to make this offseason. Yeah, I don't want to blame. Look, I don't think Scott needs to be fired. I, I think that he does need to clean stuff up, especially third downs. They were one for ten on third downs, one for three in the red zone, and obviously Taylor fumbling is not on Scott. But the fact is, they do run these plays in the red zone that always net negative yardage, that puts them in bad situations. Let's stop being cute. And I understand the Curtis Samuel touchdown run from earlier in the year. That worked one time. But can we get back to hammering the ball, please, and just shove it down their throat? I mean, I had, like, read on a weekend night. Like, just enjoy (laughs) it, dude. There's You get good stuff out of it. You know, be like Reed, just enjoy the heck out of it. But I will say this, I do I will give credit to Scott Turner because there was a third and one where he called a play action rollout with Taylor and it completely caught them by surprise. And uh, mm-hmm. Taylor got 15 yards on it, and that's something I've been wanting for them to run because third and one, it seems like it's a huge issue for them at times. And so I, I was glad to see that. But that being said, that was the one third down that they got. <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> was, the, was the one that was my idea from a while ago so there you go you're welcome commanders but no um they got to clean up and i don't think scott needs to be let go or anything but i do think that there is kind of like with taylor where taylor is mitching, missing the touch on throws it seems like scott is missing the touch on the game plan and being able to fit things in in the right spaces and i kind of talked about with logan before because it's like they are doing good things but at times it's like they're trying to be too cute and trying to prove something, if that makes sense. Like, I definitely yeah. think that the Wink Martin uh, Martindale thing is legit, and I think that Wink has won it twice in a, while, a row. Oh, oh yeah, oh, and yeah, and it's kind of messed up because they knew exactly what we would be wanting, and that's <laughs> wanting to do, and that's the unfortunate part. That being said, we all have to hang our hats high. You know, this I know this was a bad loss, but the fact is, this team continued to fight to the bitter end. You know, I rewatched the fourth quarter today going back. I'm like, dude, like, you have to give them credit. Like, they don't quit. Like, even when they should, they still continue to fight. And they still continue to put themselves in a position to win. And I think that that deserves a lot of credit. And I was very hard today. I was very angry today. I felt like I had good reasons to be angry. But that being said, I understand that I'm wrong in most cases. And uh, But looking forward meaningful December football is what you want out of your football team and they're still fighting for their life right now and they, they're continuing to do so and they haven't laid down and that deserves respect and uh, doesn't deserve to be piled on they deserve the, the benefit of knowing that they are going to give it their all even though they might not have a great first half they're still going to battle their butts off in the second and lord knows they might be able to steal one but they, they should have beat the Giants Twice, yeah, should have both should have won both of these games these past. I guess what has it been three weeks? But dude, again, that, that said, holding call before the first touch uh, turnover and touchdown by Kayvon Thibodeau, dude, I cannot tell you how frustrated I was watching that. Mm-hmm. Like, son, I watched George Kittle last week block a dude in the back in front of Christian McCaffrey who sprung a first down run doesn't get called. This man literally has two fingers on his shoulder pad and they called holding on immediately, and it's yep. just like. Why? <laughs> Why? It's just one of them games where it's like, like you said earlier, it's just one of those like primetime games, like just straight up 
old school Washington primetime game, you come out and you just fall flat on your face. And yeah. to a lot of people's points, the referees were like to your point, the referees did make some horrible calls, some horrible uh but Logan brought up a good point well. saying that they missed a whole bunch as well for, no, for yeah, New they, York. No, and did, I think that there there's something to be said for that. And it's then, just look, one of those that, annoying things. Yeah, that happens in every game, but yeah. it just seems like Every time it calls, happens, it's like cata- it's catastrophic. It, it seems like when it happens for us, when we don't get a call or we do get a bad call on us, it always happens at the most like high intense, like worst time. Oh, your sound went out again. Hey, we got one more question. This is from Scott Harley. I'm sorry. Question for tonight from Scott. Thank you in the UK. Oi, do you think the team has genuinely progressed in the last three years? We utterly pooped the bed last night this morning for me. Why I stayed up until 4... 4.30 for that, I'll never know. It's clear we've gotten better in positional groups, but what's holding us back from taking that next step and contending? What was the question? I was, like, frozen for, like, 80% of that. Basically, do you think? Do you genuinely think that the team has progressed over the last three years? He thinks that they pooped the bed last night. He doesn't know why he stayed up to 4.30 for that, and it's clear <laughs> they've gotten better in positional groups, but what's holding the, us back from taking that next step and contending? Um, I think we uh, all know the answer to this question. Um, I mean, it's a quarterback position, man. Like, it sucks. I know, like you said, Taylor is out there playing his heart out, doing his best. But at the end of the day, sometimes when you're playing, you're trying to do your best. Sometimes your best just isn't good enough sometimes. But like you said, the positional groups, like I do think they are better than where they started off three years ago when Rivera first got here. Obviously, the defense is playing back to that level and to the standard that, standard that they were in 2020. Um, the position groups, like on the offensive side of the ball, are better. Uh, the secondary, obviously, is better. Got a lot of young pieces up and coming. So the, they have there's pieces on both sides of the ball that are there. Um, they've drafted well, pretty well over the past couple of years. It's just the position that we've been trying to solve for the past 30 years, the quarterback. And especially nowadays, the NFL nowadays, where it's a quarterback-driven league, it's an offensive-driven league, it's a passing league for the most part now still. You got to have that guy back there that can put the ball into your playmaker's hands and put points on the board. And when you choose to go after a quarterback and cut some guys off the offensive line and bring in some guys that you thought would be upgrades or serviceable upgrades, and it turns out that the guys that you cut were actually better than the guys that you brought in, you have a makeshift offensive line. Offensive line. You got uh, older pieces on the offensive line that are getting beat by younger guys on the, on the defensive side of the ball. So that's all just a recipe for disaster on the offensive side of the ball. When you don't have a quarterback that can make all the throws and is playing up to par, and you have a makeshift offensive line that is just getting their butts whooped, playing and play out for the most part, it's not going to be a lot of success, no matter who's really back there, unless you're Pat Mahomes or somebody like that. So at the end of the day, like I said, we all know the answer. It's the quarterback position needs to be – play a little bit better. And I think that if we just had like average, so like a little bit above average quarterback, this could easily be a 10, 11 plus win team this year or any year going forward. But just got to get that quarterback position locked down and uh, solved. You guys are stuck in this. I've been telling you our three Super Bowls by three different quarterbacks. We keep wanting a franchise quarterback. I keep telling you. don't even need a franchise. I just want an average, an an average guy. That guy's going to get injured in the first game of the season. (laughs) That's just how it is here, fellas. Let's just embrace it and understand that the way that we're going to win in this league is our way. It's going to be unique. It's going to be unique to us, and it's going to be different. But we are going to win, and it's going to be based on team football. Yes, do we want a franchise quarterback? Absolutely, we would all love that benefit, but is it going to happen? Not sure. What is? Are they better than the past three years? Have they progressed? Without a freaking doubt. Let's let's look at this from this perspective. How are the Carolina Panthers doing right now? I'll wait, yeah. Scott. I'll wait. I'll wait. They're doing crappy. How is Washington doing right now? Oh, they've made the playoffs, uh, possibly going to make the playoffs twice in three years, doing a COVID year uh, with going eight different quarterbacks. Um one snapped his leg. Like, what are we doing here? Of course they've progressed in the past three years. They're playing good, and these these guys fight to the bitter end. Do you think that these players are fighting to the bitter end before 2019? No. They didn't care about Like, this is a completely different team. That being said, what's holding them back? Time. To be perfectly honest, luck. Injuries. 
Because the one issue that everyone, I think, can agree on is the offensive line is not giving the quarterbacks the ability to be great up until this point. And it's unfortunate because injuries since August have created this kind of buildup, this snowball effect of injuries that has caused catastrophic situations and has cost them football games, to be perfectly honest with you. And I don't think it's wrong to say that in the least, but it has happened. But that is... We could talk to the end of the day about quarterback, but if you can't protect your quarterback, there's nothing you can do. And, yes, I know people are going to say, we had Brandon Sheriff and Trent Williams. I understand that. But both those guys wanted to leave. Brandon Sheriff, Brandon Sheriff wanted to leave because of the media around here locally. You're talking about a dude from Iowa. He doesn't like the folk around here, be perfectly honest with you. And those that are complaining about Brandon Sheriff who left, he probably wouldn't have liked you in the first place because you're probably <laughs> the ones that would have ran your mouth about him. That being said, with Trent Williams, that was – yeah, you would have loved to have Trent here, but Trent wanted to go with Kyle. It's a fact of the matter. Didn't want to be here anymore. I mean, yeah, I mean, look, they botched the whole Trent Williams situation, obviously. Don't got to go back and rehash all that nonsense up. Um, like you said, Brandon Sheriff, you can, offer, you can offer any player all the money in the world. It's their decision if they want to be here or not. Clearly, he didn't want to be here for, I get it, good reasons. But when, like I said, when you get let a guy that's, you brought in, played very, very well for you, gave a contract to an Eric Flowers. He's at home, still, which is crazy to me. He's still at home, like not signed to anybody, but who knows why. Um, so, yeah, a guy like Eric Flowers, obviously Chase Rouye getting injured was a huge blow. And then obviously Tyler Larson as well getting injured was a huge blow. But, yeah, just like I said, overall, the offensive line that is a like patched up offensive lines getting older, that's the, like you said, always injured not playing it, not playing the best, not playing the greatest right now. If you mix that in with a quarterback that is, has some lows, highs, lows, highs, more lows than highs, it's not going to be a great recipe for success, no matter who, who you have on the offensive side of the ball as far as your weapons and whatnot. So yeah, just got to get better on the offensive line. It got to get better in the trenches. got to get better at the quarterback position. Right, I didn't mean to be aggressive towards you, Scott. I just hate the question. <laughs> um, because I know that this comes back to Brian Dable and the Giants in their first year doing well. But this kind of brings you back to me talking to my little brother about the Virginia Tech Hokies when they hired Justin Fuente. And uh, I said, I don't believe in this dude. I don't think he's going to be able to create the program and replicate what Beamer was able to do here. And, yeah, he did pretty well his first year because he came in and everything was built for him, kind of like Brian Dayball. But let's see how things go in two to three years. When you have to construct your own roster, when you have to progress these own players in a couple of years, let's see how you do. Because I'd be willing to bet it's going to be the complete opposite of what's happened with Rivera. Great first year, small step, small step, small step. I'd be willing to bet. But that being said, Mora, the owner of the Giants, probably has a lot more to say to that than I do and had a lot more power and control in that breath. But that being, we don't need to go down that rabbit hole. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this episode. Hall, I appreciate you for coming in here. Better late than never, and I really needed uh, the support, and I appreciate you for doing that. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap us up for this episode. Just remember, we still are contention for playoffs. That's better than being like, crapping out and not having a chance at all, right? They still have, they have their destiny in their hands still. I know it's a hard game against San Francisco coming up, but we thought the same thing going against Philadelphia in Philadelphia. You never know, man, especially coming off a short week. You never know. So, uh, all right, everybody, we'll see you guys on Thursday. Have a good, safe week. Stay warm. I'm Kyle. I'm Hull. All right, everybody, we'll see you then. Sorry, Scott, I wasn't mean to be aggressive at you, brother. All right, everybody, <laughs> we'll see you on Thursday. Washington football. Woo! Peace. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server, where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, Washington football. Woo!